Amen. Thank you, Robert, for leading us in that time of, of worship. You know, today we're, we're partaking in the, in the Lord's Supper, communion, as we call it. But before we do, I wanted us to, to, to be sure we understand, take a few moments to reflect on what we are doing when we share this meal together. We know that, that Jesus uh, first celebrated this with his disciples in the upper room. And we know that we as a church, ever since then, have celebrated this meal together. And so today, if you have your Bible with you, I want you to take it out and open it to, to uh, 1 Corinthians. I hope you have your Bible with you today, but we're going to go to 1 Corinthians near the back of your Bible. It's right after Acts and Romans, but we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Beginning in verse 17, this is what the, the word of the Lord says. Now in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. Indeed, it is necessary that there be factions among you so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. When you come together then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after the supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Thanks be to God for his word. In theology and in church custom, the Lord's Supper is often called the Eucharist. Eucharist comes from this Greek phrase used here for given thanks. But what are we giving thanks for? We're giving thanks for Jesus, for what he has done, for what he is doing, and for what he will do. See, the Lord's Supper points to forgiveness. First and foremost, it is about what Christ has done. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about Christ's sacrifice. This is the dominant theme in this passage, and it was the dominant theme with the disciples in that upper room. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread. In that upper room, he took bread and he broke it after he had given thanks. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and, and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. What Jesus, what Jesus was doing when Jesus, he, he gave thanks for bread and when he gave bread and, and wine to his disciples and said that this is my body and this is my blood, they were partaking in a Passover meal. The 
Passover. The Passover was a reminder that God's people were delivered not only from slavery, but from death itself. All the way back in Exodus, of the, of the ten plagues sent upon Egypt by God, the tenth was the worst. The death of all the firstborn in Egypt. And God told the Israelites to, to sacrifice a, a spotless lamb and to mark their, their doorposts their doorposts with, uh, with, with, with a lintel there the, to, to, to mark it with the blood. And so in the same way, in the Lord's Supper, we are marked. We remember that we have been delivered not only from slavery to sin, but from death itself through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God. We look to the cross and we see his love poured out. Jesus died for us. And not just for us, but for you, for me, for each of us, as if we were the only ones. So because we are covered by the blood of the Lamb, our sins have been washed away and death can no longer harm us. Now let me be clear here. Let me be clear. By observing the Lord's Supper, we are not forgiven. That's not what this is. Over the centuries, many an unbeliever has partaken of the body and the blood. It has yet to save anyone. It has not done them one bit of good. It's not the sacrament that the Catholic Church makes it out to be. Instead, what we eat and what we drink cannot save us, but Jesus can. Only Jesus can. In the Baptist church, we call this an ordinance, something that we observe, something that we participate in, something that we do, like baptism. And it may not be a sacrament, but make no mistake, it is definitely a spiritual act. It's a solemn act. But it's not supposed to be superficial or inconsequential in any way. See, the church at Corinth, they were, they were sharing in the Lord's Supper, but they were doing it all wrong. And so Paul warns them, he says, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. He says, to, he says that a person should examine himself in this way. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment. Paul isn't trying to, to exclude people. Paul isn't trying to keep people from taking the Lord's Supper. That's not the goal here. The goal is to keep them in the right manner, to keep them in the right mindset, that they would receive it in the right way. This self-examination that he refers to and its subsequent warnings, they're not meant to fill us with feelings of dread over our unworthiness or doubt that we are welcome in the Lord's presence. We aren't worthy, and we can never make ourselves worthy, and that's why we need Jesus. But if you have Jesus, then you possess all the worthiness you will ever need. That's what he's talking about. Paul, Paul is saying we need to examine ourselves and search our souls to root out sin. Sin can be a barrier between us and God. He's saying, hey, don't come to the table with unrepentant sin. Search yourself. Jesus' 
forgiveness that he offers to us freely was very costly to him. Don't cheapen it by continuing to do what you do. The Lord's Supper points to forgiveness, but it also points to family. Realizing that we are all in need of God's forgiveness, we see that each of us are at the table for the same reason. Jesus. He bought us with his blood and brought us together. He bought us and he brought us together as a family of God. The Lord's Supper is a family meal. It's only available for the Lord's people. When we, when we partake, we identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. We proclaim that uh, we are in him and he is in us. But we also identify with those to our left and to our right. We identify with each other. And we proclaim that together we are one body. So when the Lord's people come together to this communal table, realizing they have been bought and they have been brought by the Lord, unity is the end result. That wasn't the case in Corinth. Paul's like, I should be praising you, but you come together not for the better, but for the worse. There's always going to be division between the saved and the, the not saved, but you are creating division where there doesn't need to be any. What is meant for unity, the Lord's Supper is bringing about disunity because of what they're doing. Some are gluttonously partaking without others. Some are selfishly serving themselves instead of serving others. Paul's like, you got homes to eat and drink in. Go and do your sinning there. But when we eat this bread and when we drink this cup, we do this together. We don't do this alone. We do it as a family who has been reborn with purpose. I mean, just one chapter earlier here, Paul says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body since all of us share the one bread. You get a piece. And you get a piece. And you get a piece. And I get a piece. We eat and we drink from the Lord's table together. That's why it's called communion. We eat the bread and we drink the cup as one body. The last thing I want us to see here is that the Lord's Supper not only points to forgiveness, it points to family, but it also points to faithfulness. Not our faithfulness, but his. We eat the bread because he is faithful to provide. He's our provider. Jesus is the bread of life. Just as God's people were provided for in the wilderness by manna, the Lord still provides manna, daily bread for his people. And we drink the cup because he is faithful to forgive our sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus says that this cup is a new covenant, not the old one, a new one in his blood. And God never breaks a covenant. He always keeps his promises. In the Lord's Supper, we, we celebrate that God has kept his promises to us, that his promises to provide for us, his promises to forgive us, but, but the Lord's Supper speaks of another promise. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord is returning. And that's a promise. 
We know that he died for us. We know that he rose again for us. We know that he ascended into heaven for us. In heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and he is making intercession for us. But do not, do not, do not forget that one day he will be returning for us. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. And so just as he says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, Jesus promises to us that he is preparing a place for you and he's preparing a place for me and he will return one day to keep his promise. One day we will see Jesus face to face. One day we will be with him forever and on that day we will dine at the king's table. The Lord is faithful. So before we take part in this Lord's Supper that has been bought and brought by the Lamb, let's prepare ourselves with a time of prayer. I'm going to give us all a few moments to pray, but I want us to examine ourselves with these questions. Ask yourself, have you trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation? Is there, is there a part of your life that, that maybe you haven't trusted to Christ? Can you say that your life is pleasing to the Lord? Ask yourself, are there hidden things in your life that need to be dealt with this morning? Before we partake, is there any problem that exists between you and and another believer, a brother or sister in Christ. Now is the time. Let's take a few minutes minutes and seek the Lord in prayer before we come to the table.